Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll get started because I actually have a fair number of slides to get through today. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I usually tell people, you know, feel free to interrupt me as I'm going along. If you have any questions, I am going to try to talk about a number of different products today. So uh, uh, if you're looking for more detail, like I say, just uh, feel free to throw something in the chat or turn on your mic and ask a question and be happy to address it. Um, we haven't done one of these for a while, but generally, you know, when we try to do a webinar usually every month. Um, and there's just a big run of trade shows, but this one's gonna be about some of the, uh, the innovative products that uh, we actually make here at Insight. So, you know, as you probably know, Insight's a manufacturer's rep and distributor, but we also uh, design and build some of our own products. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking to you today about, about some of those. And there's a few of them actually, there's enough of them that I'm not even gonna get a chance to talk to them about, about all of them. So I've already done webinars about our composite samplers and about our automated grab sampling systems. So I'm not gonna to touch on those today. There are other webinars that are posted up on our YouTube channel. And so if you have any interest in those, um, certainly feel free to reach out to myself or, or Jaden and, uh, and we can at least point you to where there's uh, brochures and information about that as well as uh, some YouTube videos. So what I'm going to talk about first is I'm going to give you a little bit of overview, as I always do, about who Inside Analytical is. And then I'm going to go through a number of different products related to sample system design, related to sample distribution panels, uh, moisture generators, and a way to calibrate moisture analyzers, a couple of different types of probes, heat exchangers, carryover sensors, things like that. So. Uh, Fair bit that I'm gonna go through. I'm not gonna go into great depths on any of them. Uh, we will be sending out, uh, you know, as we usually do uh, an aftercare email that kind of has some of the brochures and some technical information about those products. So Inside Analytical itself, Calgary-based systems integrator, distributor. Um, we operate out of about 20,000 square feet in the Northeast of Calgary. Uh, very good building access for bringing shelters in and things like that. So we'll do full analyzer integration, analyzer buildings, uh, down to sample panels and the like. For all of you, my Canadian colleagues, you know, we're AB83 compliant, uh, CRN numbers uh, for anybody here from the US. We just have some special pressure regulations around building systems in Canada that we have to meet. And so we're an ABA certified AB83 certified fabricator. Um, we've got great documentation skills. A lot of the people that are with me here have worked with me at other companies like when I was at Amatech and Western Research. Um, so we've got really good document control. So if we have to work with big engineering companies, uh, we do it all the time, full document packages. Uh, we've actually implementing a system where uh, we have a customer portal for every job that we've done. And so if you're an end user, there'll be a QR code on your system. You can hit that QR code, manufacturer's data book, drawings, all that sort of stuff, service reports all up on the web. Journeyman instrumentation, electrical people. So, you know, we're uh, our field service guys, our guys in the shop, we're all journeymen or apprentices. Uh, we do full factory acceptance tests here in Calgary. Like I said, we do full systems integration capabilities as well. Everything from custom sample, sample, sample systems, process analyzer integrations, PLC and automation work related to the analyzers or grab sampling panels of full analyzer buildings. Some of you may know me from, I used to teach sample system courses all over the world on a design analyzer sample systems. We believe it's one of the things we really excel at here. Insight's kind of funny for a manufacturer's rep distributor company because for the longest time, we actually had no salespeople. We were basically all technical guys who just had lots of contacts in the industry and got known for the fact that we'll design you a system that actually works. We'll do everything from front-end engineering design. If you're looking for somebody to help you specify an analyzer for a project, detailed engineering, uh, fabrication, 
Uh, well, of course, we'll do on-site commissioning as well with that. But a big piece of what we'll try to do is field service. Um, we have run service out of uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Grand Prairie, and uh, any product that we put out in the field, we like to be able to service. I've just got three guys down in the U.S. Uh, with some of our principals just doing factory training on some of those products. All right, I'm going to launch into a few of the things that we do that are kind of unique and you may not be aware of that we do. So, you know, if we think about a, let's say, a, a typical sample system for a gas phase application, and especially for something like this one specifically around the idea of sampling natural gas. Well, a PID like this may be, you know, kind of similar to a lot of the ones that you would see. Um, sample coming in, going through a membrane filtration unit. We have the upper, the filtered side is then going off to a regulator. We have the opportunity to bring in a calibration gas as well. Regulate pressure that goes out to an analyzer or return from the analyzer that's going to go to vent and the bypass around the filter going to that vent side as well. Very kind of typical for the layout for a simple sample system in front of a, say a natural gas H2S analyzer or a GC. We had a client who, uh, well, TransCanner Pipelines was looking for, they wanted to have very fast response time, minimal chances of leaks and uh, shelter space was wall space was really important to them, conserving wall space as well. So we've taken that entire analyzer sample system and basically made that into uh, a simple sample system block. Looks like this, a couple of bolts so it can sit onto a piece of Unistrut. And there's that entire sample system done in uh, surface mount components. If you're familiar with NASI, um, Compact, virtually no tubing runs. All of the flow passages are machined into here. I don't know how easily you can see it there, but we actually kind of machine the flow path right onto the surface. Um, we got rid of all the MPT fittings. Everything is straight thread and O-rings. So there's no swack in here. There's none of that. Um, you know, if you're doing something like a dew point analyzer, uh, some of those thread sealant materials and cause a lot of bias on the analyzer. So we've done everything with straight thread fittings, tire analyzer, sample system, one block, screw it on the wall, you get contamination in it, yard it out, put another one on, send it back to us and we clean it, or you can clean it yourself. So uh, we put this in and replace a standard sample system that you would see on a backpack. And we had a 2X improvement in the speed of response of the analyzer. Although we've specifically designed this around the new ABB Sensi Plus applications because this client was looking at low or at low concentrations of H2S and very fast and wanted very fast response times, it's really suitable for any sort of relatively clean system. I should mention, you know, it's got a full membrane filtration system built into it right at the top. These are standard uh, genie type membranes. Um, so you can pick the high flow membrane, standard membranes. Um, we've just done some things internally to again, minimize volume or about two and a half times faster than a typical uh, genie filter. So we've used this primarily on clean gas applications or for play, uh, or after some stream, something that's had some upstream filtration. And I'm going to talk about a sample distribution block next that has uh, uh, filtration on the upstream side and on the high pressure side, again, for natural gas. It's nickel plated, so that gives you that surface finish like you would expect from, let's say, electropolished tubing. So low surface area for absorption. It's got very low volumes on that inlet filter side, so it gives you fast response times. All of the connections are, of course, internal, so it reduces our risks of leaks. We don't have any NPT or tapered threads, so we don't have to worry about thread galling. We don't have to worry about thread sealants. 
um, you know, I've seen systems where pieces of Teflon tape have come off and ended up plugging flow paths. And so um, we tried to get rid of all of that possibility in the system. It's machined out of uh, aluminum with nickel plating and the aluminum gives you a really good heat transfer. And so that's important because when you're gonna do pressure regulation, uh, you always worry about Joule Thompson effect. And this actually allows the aluminum block, block to pull heat or transfer, pull heat from the block into the regulator and transfer more heat. And like I said, very fast response time. You can see you know, how simple an installation is. There's that ABB Sensi Plus analyzer, and they just mounted the block. We actually designed the screw separation so it fits straight on the strut that they mount the ABB unit on and pipe it, tube it over the analyzer. So let's talk about sample distribution. You know, if we look at a natural gas metering station or a SEM system, um, there's often more than one analyzer there. And so again, our client came to us and said, you know, we get these large panels that have regulators and valves and opportunities to add additional sample points in, uses up a lot of wall space in our metering building. So they wanted something that was gonna give them again, better response time, use up less wall space. So we took the same sort of concept, this idea of machining a custom design sample system and incorporated on the high pressure side, a high, potentially a high pressure sample coming in, flowing past a membrane filter. There's two taps that can be taken off on the high pressure side. So in a natural gas application, we might be looking at putting, say, uh, a dew point analyzer, whether it's a manual like a Chandler or an automated dew point analyzer like a Z-Gas uh, on one of those high pressure taps, because those analyzers need that full line pressure natural gas. The other high pressure tap we've got in there, we can put things in a talk in a little bit about moisture generation, and we can put a moisture generator for calibrating moisture analyzers off of one of those other high pressure taps. Two stages of pressure reduction, again, on this aluminum substrate, so we get good heat transfer, helps us mitigate Joule Thompson effects. And then optional places where we can add a three-way valve in that allows us to add up to four analyzers along the flow path, each with their individual span ports. There's also a common port on there which can be used to do a common zero to all of the analyzers or for a purge of the entire system, or you can add a, a, a fifth analyzer onto there. Or we have a client who says, I actually have another place where I've got low pressure gas and I wanna be able to bring a different sample in occasionally. Flow orifices control the bypass flow on the uh, sweep side of the filter. And we also keep a continuous flow through this entire path so that if these aren't used and they're blanked off, they don't become dead legs. So again, you know, we've taken that entire sample system, which you can imagine would probably take up a pretty decent sized back then. And there it is sort of implemented into one block. You can see there's, more, there's three valves there. We put blanking plates on if you don't need to have those extra streams. So there's blanking plates on over here and then three streams in use. Um, similarly, if you only needed one stage of pressure reduction, we can just put a blanking plate on over the other pressure reduction point. And there's that membrane filter sitting there right on the inlet. So there's advantages to putting that first stage of filtration on the high pressure side because when the gas is compressed, it moves really slowly. So you don't get a lot of velocity over that filter element, actually lets the filter work better. So we can run this as an initial sample distribution panel, then run off the other block, you know, this block that I showed you before, for an analyzer specific measurement as well. So, you know, that 
what would seem like a complex sample panel is all incorporated into that block gives us a standardized layout for customers, same form factor. So for TransCanada Pipelines, they said, you know, we have metering buildings all across Canada, but there's also all the TC energy lines down into the US. And they said, I want a product that I can get the exact same form factor, exact same configuration. Once my guys are trained on it, it's the exact same every place we go. And you may wonder, well, what about just using, you know, the Suede Lock or the Parker or the Surcore uh, Nessie type systems? And the thing about those is they have lots and lots and lots of components. Every time you see a surface valve, surface mount valve, let's say, on one of those systems, underlying it, there's a, a customizable substrate that has three or four components associated with it. Not only that, there's certain things that aren't available in that substrate, like, for example, a large surface area filter, membrane filter. So this allows us to use components that meet the NESI standard or don't meet the NESI standard, but we can machine into the surface and allows us greater flexibility in what we put together. So in these blocks, we have inlet filtration, dual stages of regulator, two line pressure outputs, four low pressure output, outputs to the analyzer, another optional low pressure inlet, like I said, that could be for a common uh, purge, um, individual calibration ports for each of the pieces of analytical equipment, common pressure relief valve and drain. And to talk about scoop probes in a couple of minutes. Um, if you, we have options to take the flow restrictor out of the bypass, and allows you to run a high pressure fast loop and mitigates uh, methane emissions. So you don't have to have a low pressure vent of the methane atmosphere. Um, so we'll talk about scoop probes and sampling at high pressures uh, a couple slides up. One of the things I did mention on these high pressure points was that we could use this uh, for a moisture generator. So I'm going to talk about moisture generators next. Uh, it's kind of a unique thing. So if you've been using uh, moisture analyzers, whether it's in natural gas applications, I mean, moisture is one of the most ubiquitous measurements we do. Measuring trace moisture in streams like uh, everything from natural gas, hydrogen and recycled gas and refineries, Chlorine at ethylene dichlorine plants. We've always got interest in measuring trace moisture um, because it attacks catalyst beds. Has a lot of has a lot of in properties that we don't want to have going on in our process. Causes corrosion in pipelines, etc. The issue has been there's not really been a good way to calibrate moisture analyzers. You can buy a cylinder of moisture, you know. It's, say 1,000 ppm of nitrogen, and it's supposed to have a certain content of moisture, but they aren't very stable. They're difficult to transport. Moisture tends to absorb on the surfaces, so they tend to not be that reliable. So what we've fabricated is a transportable, it could be used for fixed insulation, but originally what the idea was, I want to be able to take a device out in the field with me, I'm a field service tech and go and validate that my moisture analyzer is working. And the way we did it is like this. We allowed for a high pressure inlet. I, I put 2000 kPa here. It could be 5000 kPa, 10,000 kPa, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is what the regulator is rated, rated for. We bring that inlet gas in and regulate it down to some known pressure. So on this one, I'm saying I regulate it down to 1,000 kPa. I allow that gas to flow over uh, a chamber where it will become saturated with water vapor. And if I know the temperature at which it's being saturated at, that lets me know how much water vapor it can pick up. 
whoops, I got two degrees in here. Um, so at 20 degrees C, the vapor pressure water is 2.3 kV. So if this block is running at 20, if this assembly was running at 20 degrees C, any gas that comes out of this saturator should have 2.3 kPa of water vapor in it. Since I know the total pressure and I know the partial pressure of water, that lets me know the concentration of water vapor that's coming out of the saturator. If my pressure is 1,000 kPa and my water content is 2.3 kPa, well, 2.3 kPa out of 1,000 is 0.23%. So that's the concentration of my water vapor as it comes out of the saturator. I take the same inlet gas, and this can be cylinder gas, but it can also be process gas. If you're using this at a natural gas pipeline, this can just be your natural gas from the pipeline. So it may already contain some water vapor. We take a second stream of that, we split a stream off and allow it to run over a molecular sieve dryer. So this stream should have no water vapor in it. We then mix those two streams together. If we know the ratio of the flow rates between the two sides, for example, here I said I have 50. For every one unit of flow I've got going on this side, I've got 50 units of flow going on the other side. So it might be I have one liter a minute flowing on one side and 20 cc's a minute on the, on the wet side. I just take the ratio of the, of the flow rates. So I've got one unit of flow going through my saturator at 0.23%. My total flow is one plus 50 some of the two other flows, I divide those two and it says I'm gonna generate 45 PPM. So it tells me that at this outlet, I will have 45 PPM of water vapor. So this becomes a simple mechanical way, no moving parts, well, except for the valves that we have to, and regulators that we can adjust, but um, we don't have any electronic parts in there. We don't have to worry about hazardous area certifications. It's a simple mechanical way to generate a known concentration of water vapor. If I want a different concentration, all I have to do is change the regulator. Change the pressure, I change the amount of H2O. So I can actually do a multi-point check on my analyzer's operation. Also, if I close the valve on the saturator side, and only allow flow to go through the dryer side, it allows me to check zero on the analyzer. So it gives me a way to check zero, to bump to a span point, to bump to another span point, and see, let's say, whether I'm linear. We also have a back pressure regulator on here. Oh, I missed it on my end. Ah, I missed it on my PID. Ah. Supposed to be a back pressure regulator on the drawing there. Um, there's a back pressure regulator on there that lets us control the outlet pressure. That means we can use this to test a dew point analyzer as well. A dew point analyzer is usually operated at higher inlet pressures. And even if I'm using something like an Amatec 3050 as a moisture analyzer, it wants 35 pounds at its inlet. So by setting that back pressure regulator, I can control the outlet pressure that this block is, uh, is creating. Yeah. Um, and so that has to, actually has to have a BPR to vent. So I took our AutoCAD drawings and put them into Visio because um, it just goes better into PowerPoint and uh, missed that, I'm sorry. Um, so right now, we build these blocks and they're optimized. The standard configuration is for that typical sort of natural gas kind of range we want to measure. Most natural gas pipelines are arranged something like, uh, have a specification that they're supposed to be under sort of seven pounds per million cubic feet or about 200 ppm, works up to about 150 milligrams per cubic meter. So these curves just show 
the range of moisture concentrations we can get, PPM on this side, pounds per million cubic feet, milligrams per cubic meter at different operating temperatures. So if I'm running this at 20 degrees C, uh, you know, at 100 pounds, I'll generate a water content of about 180 ppm. If I run it at 500 uh, uh, psi, I'll only have about 40 ppm. So like I said, by changing the pressure on the regulator, we can change how much water we're putting out to the analyzer and kind of test it over a bit of its linear range. Thought I had a slide to the picture of the block in it, but basically that's the entire moisture generator. So inlet regulator, pressure gauge, temperature gauge, pressure gauge for the back pressure regulator, uh, molecular sieve dryer down here, the saturation and flow control is all being taken care of inside this machine block again. So this can just sit in a guy's service kit, takes it out into the field. So I'm gonna go and bump test that moisture analyzer. It can, we have clients who are installing them as fixed installations in the analyzer shelter. So they say, hey, I can run a cow whenever I want. Um, so you know, all of that's possible, but originally the idea was, hey, we're just gonna let people take this out in the field and go and bump test their analyzers. We do everything from simple little quill type probes. Again, our quills are a little bit different. Uh, we tend to use a, a hemispherical tip on our quill probes. It actually gives us a little bit better rejection of any entrained aerosols or contamination. Um, we will add on a little valve assembly. And again, we have clients who are really interested in fast response times. If, if you screw a, a female, MPT onto a male MPT, it actually leaves a little mixing volume as a gap in between the two. So we actually machine pieces to try to minimize the volume in that connection. Um, these probes are very economical. We'll do a quill probe for anywhere from about 300 to $500 US, uh, Canadian, I should say. Um, Cost-effective, reliable probes. We've had a client who had a lot of uh, uh, Probes that are commonly used in the industry and ha that have some uh, mechanical seals like glands in them. And they said, you know, I'm having problems with leakage. And so they wanted something that was just a simple, reliable probe. There's no welding here. It's machined out of a solid block. So and no leakage points. We do a few other things with probes though. And what I want to talk about a bit um, is uh, probes that be, can be used to create a fast loop. So, you know, most of our analyzers are, are extractive. Same with most of our things like grab samplers. We're doing a composite sampler or a grab sample. Um, we often have to have a continuous flowing loop by it in order to make sure we have fresh samples there. You know, we put fast loops in because our analyzers are a long distance away or because we've, uh, you know, if we get higher flow rates through there, we can get faster response. Again, most fast loop filters, like a swirl type filter will say, well, I need a certain volumetric flow in order for me to operate. Conventional ways of doing fast loops are that we have to have some large source of differential pressure. So either we're sampling from a higher pressure here and we have a lower pressure return and that allows fluid to flow or we put a pump in or we're venting to atmosphere or to a low pressure flare header. Um, all of those can be ways to get a fast loop, but sometimes we don't have that opportunity. Say a natural gas pipeline. We don't have a uh, a low pressure place to return back to. We can't pump it back into the high pressure of the pipeline from a low pressure analyzer. And there's a lot of regulations coming up that people would like to mitigate the amount that they're releasing to atmosphere. And so, you know, methane being um, whatever the number is, 40, 50 times the CO2 equivalent as far as a greenhouse gas 
people are trying to mitigate their methane emissions. And so a fast loop that can return back into the same process would be ideal. There's common problems when, that we uh, experience with things that require fast loops or with fast loops themselves. So one of them is, again, this natural gas type application. You know, um, we've got a pipeline over here that's at high pressure. We want to run a fast loop to get out to where the analyzer is, but we go, well, where are we going to vent it to? We don't have a low pressure return point. We don't have a low pressure flare header at, say, a gas metering station. Currently, what most of them do is they vent atmosphere. And so as a result, we can see fairly high methane emissions from a natural gas metering station. If it's, we're looking at liquid fast loops, someone might have decided to put a pump into the system. And so they'll say, well, I'm gonna pump the liquid back to process. Well, if you do that, uh, fast loop pumps are expensive. And they can also be very high maintenance items. And we try to avoid pumps in our sample systems because we'd say, I don't want to make my instrument mechanic become a pump mechanic. And he can spend most of his time fixing the pumps. Um, again, you know, with a high pressure gas analyzer from a gas, let's say you've got 60 bar gas, you've regulated that pressure down. Where are you going to vent it to? It's difficult to return it back to the process if it was a high pressure. Atmospheric vents cause emissions. And now we're getting people saying, I don't want you putting more capacity onto my flare line. People are trying to mitigate the amount that goes to flare as well. So we got to think about where are we going to put this stuff? And then if we're looking at liquid samples, um, and we're just doing this on a CO2 pipeline, going through this with, on a CO2 pipeline with a, with a client. Um, if we're going to put a vaporizer out there at the sample tap, Vaporizers take a liquid sample and they make it into a gas phase sample. Even if we've got a lot of gas flow, it doesn't take very much liquid to make a liter of gas. You know, the typical number for hydrocarbons is about 300 to one. So if I've got liquid hydrocarbons over here, and if I'm flowing a thousand milliliters a minute of gas out of it, I'm actually only flowing three milliliters a minute of liquid into it. And so the response time can be really slow on that inlet side. Ideally, we would have a fast loop that was returning back to process. But conventional thinking would say, but you can't return back to the same pressure you're sampling from. You won't get any flow. So, we address that with what we refer to as a scoop probe. And so what we want to start out thinking about is that when a liquid flows and hits a cylindrical object, it builds a high pressure up on this side. As it flows past or around the object, it actually builds up low pressures on the side. Bernoulli's principle says wherever the velocity is the fastest, which is where it flows around that cylinder, the pressure is going to be the lowest. So we put a probe in with a orifice, a scoop-shaped orifice that's facing towards the direction of flow. So we have that large opening facing the, the pressure, the direction of flow. My flow is going this way, so I have a high pressure region right here. There it is, there's my high pressure zone. What that does is tries to push flow into the scoop. And so if we take a piece of tubing and run it up the center of that, we can now take that, use that high pressure to try to, to push fluid up this, uh, that central region there. We use the 
annulus, the region uh, in between the main probe body and the central tube, we use that as a return point. And so what we do is we put a couple of large ports on the side. Those are gonna have low pressure and we allow that low pressure side port to be a return point. And so that can then flow back into the process. And so what we've done is do some uh, computational fluid dynamics to optimize that scoop shape and, and the returns ports to maximize the amount of differential pressure we can get. So when you physically look at it, here's the, the scoop part sitting there right at the front. It drives flow into the here that comes up and comes out through the central tube. We can return that around to the other side of this T and it flows back down and comes out of the side ports. And so the velocity of the fluid flowing through the system uh, the, in the pipeline is what drives flow through the system. So I got a question in the chat, so I just gotta get my cursor over here. Um, Uh, good, both good questions. Does the probe require upstream and or downstream straight runs? Also, do we do wake frequency calculations? So yeah, ideally, you, it'd be nice to have, I mean, our, our general rule of thumb when we're doing a probe, whether it's a scoop probe or anything, is we'd like to have somewhere between two and five pipe diameters of unobstructed pipe upstream of the probe and at least two pipe diameters downstream. It's kind of the ideal. It doesn't really require that. It's just that you have better developed flow characteristics there. But we're not worried about whether the flow is laminar or turbulent there. So we don't really, I wouldn't say we really require them. If we're looking at an application, ideally we'd like to look where we can say, hey, the guy's got a straight run here with a flange on it and we can sample in there with about, two to five pipe diameters unobstructed upstream. And yeah, we do full wake frequency calculations. For those of you who aren't familiar with wake frequency calculations, when you have a cylindrical object in a flowing stream, as it flows by it, um, there's a little bit of pressure variation from side to side, and it'll make that cylindrical object start to vibrate. And if you're at the characteristic frequency that it wants to vibrate at, it can actually make it vibrate big enough to snap off. And so you want to calculate what's the optimum or what's the maximum allowable probe length you can put in for a given flow velocity in the pipe. So when we look at this as far as implementation, what we do is we build this into, create this fast loop. Remember we have this return back to process, this sample going out and we, uh, we have flow driven through the central tube, returns back through the annulus, the set vents on the side, which creates a fast loop that's still running at the line pressure. So we can use this to pull a sample out of 60 bar natural gas and go right back into that 60 bar natural gas pipeline again. Or we can use this to pull a sample of, we're looking at this on a CO2 pipeline, a, a liquid CO2 pipeline right now. We're gonna pull a sample of the liquid CO2 out, allow it to flow past a vaporizer and then go right back into the process again. The beauty of it is we have one port. We only need one flange there. Um, we can even include some sample conditioning in there. We can put a filter out here, you know, and hang a regulator off the side of it. Um, you know, this could be a, a, like I say, a filter with a regulator sitting out here that we say, well, this is gonna regulate the feed or a vaporizer that's gonna go over my analyzer. The limitations we have is there's not a lot of differential pressure to work with. 
You can't run really long sample lines. This is kind of ideal for things that you can do close to the probe. I'll talk a little bit about some of the analyzers or where that works really well. Um, I think if this works. Yeah, this is just a little, uh, we used SOLIDWORKS or uh, oh, sorry, a 3D computational fluid dynamics program just to model how the flow is. So you can kind of see what happens is we have flow through the pipeline, it's driving flow up through the probe, coming back in on that return side and going back, back to process. And this was just, uh, like I say, took a SOLIDWORKS model, ran it through a computational fluid dynamics algorithms, just to say, what, what's the flow regime going to actually look like? Um, gas applications, these things work great. I showed you a great big scoop. We make them as small as half an inch. In gas applications, they work really well because gases have really low viscosity and they have low density. So they make use of the differential pressure really well. Um, a major advantage of these is that we can return the fast loop into the process without a pump and mitigate our uh, emissions and venting. So we can use this for things like running a bypass filter and return back to process. And then, like I say, we might go out to our actual analyzer sample system now, but we run uh, or out to our analyzers and regulate after this point, but most of our bypass has been returned back to the process now. We can get really good response time, even with reasonably long sample lines. If you're flowing at 10 meters a second or 30 feet per second, which is kind of typical sort of process velocities, pipeline velocities. And let's say you have 45 bar gas. That's, you know, what's that, around 500 PSI? More than that. Closer to 700 PSI. Is that right? 700 PSI. Um, 150 feet of sample lines, 50 meters. If you're using three eighths inch lines. We don't want a lot of pressure drop along the lines. So we like to use large diameter lines. That fast loop will flow at 110 liters a minute of gas flow at 45 bar, which gives us about one meter per second velocity. So even with 150 feet of lines or 50 meters, 30, 50 meters, we'll end up getting what 30 second response time. So we can use this to create a high speed fast loop that is continuously refreshing what the material that's out at our analyzer building, but it's returning all of that fast loop to process. You know, in liquids or in gases, there's certain applications where these things are really applicable. They work really well with analyzers that we can close couple. So things like near infrared analyzers, like the JP3, or Raman analyzers, like the, uh, uh, the Kaiser Optics or the Mark Metrics. Um, analyzers that usually want to measure the process fluid at higher pressures, these things work awesome. We can actually make a system that has absolutely no emissions and returns back to the process. They're great for vaporizers out near the sample tap. If you're at a refinery or a petrochemical plant and you have a vaporizer out near the sample tap, odds are you have anywhere from 10 minutes to two hours of sample delay getting into the vaporizer. This can really improve the response time on those systems. Similarly, we've used it as a fast loop for composites, composite samplers or grab sampling stations. And so there's multiple applications where these are, are quite applicable. I'm gonna probably run out of time before I get through all these things. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these other products fairly quickly. Um, again, most of this stuff is up on our website. Um, if you're using an analyzer like an infrared or a Raman analyzer, um, or you just have a filter even that you go, well, my filter plugs regularly. I'd like to be able to back flush it. We do a solvent flush tank system that allows you to use basically a small chemical injection pump to back flush the sample system 
with something like diesel or toluene, we've used these a lot in condensate stabilizer applications. Condensates can be really waxy. And so wax builds up on filters or in analytical flow cells and something like diesel or toluene can be injected, flows back through, cleans that stuff off. So typical applications would be things like back flushing filters, cleaning inline op optical cells, or if you've got an inline liquids analyzer and you want to have a way of validating it, you can put your validation fluid in the tank and just pump it back through the flow cell to validate the analyzer is still performing. We manufacture a small liquids carryover sensor. So, you know, a lot of times, one of the biggest problems we see in our gas phase analyzers, especially if they haven't had good sample systems designed in front of them, is we get liquids carryover. It gets into our sample system and into our analyzer. And so we build a small sensor that has a little uh, vortex separator up in the top of it. So, Gas comes in, spins around the vortex, drives liquids to the walls. They drain down into the cup region down here. And we've got a uh, sensor down here, which can sense through the material that the cup part is made of, whether there's liquid building up in there. And it gives us a switch that tells us you've got liquids carryover. So we can put this in front of flare gas analyzers. When we put assets, you know, analyzers on a flare system, we always think about the gas that's in the, in, in the flare, but if someone steams out a vessel, there can be a lot of water, liquid water droplets in there. And if that gets through to our analyzer, it's gonna damage our analyzer. So we can put this on flare systems, on stack gas analyzers, any place where we wanna protect that analyzer asset, because we can use the output of the carryover sensor, just the switch, gives us a, D, uh, a digital out, that says close a valve to the sample system and stop flowing to the analyzer. You're carrying liquids over and you're going to contaminate it soon. We do sample probes that allow us to also mount some of those surface mount components. So this is a machined block again, small quill probe, and on it, there's places where we can mount up to three Nessie components. So these could be two block valves and a bleed valve. They could be isolation valve filter and regulator or isolation valve coalescer and regulator, manual isolation and pneumatic isolation, isolation regulator regulator, if we wanna do uh, two-stage pressure regulation, so all built into that probe assembly, so we can sort of do that front end sample conditioning basically right off of the sample probe. You can kind of see over here, and we mentioned over here, pressure port on the side, so we have a gauge, so you know what pressure everything's operating at, um, and then just an output to the analyzer. We, I should have brought these in actually, they're pretty cool machine parts. I didn't bring one in to show, but we do a couple of types of heat exchangers. So sometimes we want to cool a gas phase sample down in order to condense some liquids out and have it drain back to process. So we'd like to have the condensation happen rather than have a coalescing filter, let's say down at the analyzer shelter, if the liquid is going to have something like say dissolved H2S in it, we'd like that to return back to process. So we do both a passive and an active uh, assembly that can be put over top of a sample probe and just drain liquid back down. So the passive one is just a bunch of fins that are exposed to ambient air. Again, pressure regulator and gauge built into it. Um, so that if we have liquids in our process stream, again, let's say it's a flare header. Bunch of liquids come through or the flare is very, got high uh, dew point. As it flows up over the, through the uh, condenser assembly, it cools off, liquid condenses out, drains back to the process. Again, asset protection. Try not to get liquid carryover to our analyzers. So in this version, we use the ambient air as a heat sink. 
We also build an actively cooled version, kind of like a pie gas sampler, if you're familiar with the uh, 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 old fluid data pie gas samplers or what uh, ABB now calls a reflux sampler. Small assembly that sits on top of a probe, run cooling media through the outer part. You can see kind of see the heat exchanger fumes in there. Cool that assembly off with cooling water or vortex cooled air, condense liquid out and let it drain back down to the process. These are the sort of things, again, applications for this would be things like, you know, a lot of people are talking about hydrogen production now. And when you're producing hydrogen from steam or from by steam methane reforming, well, that steam work kind of steam word kind of gives you the clue. There can be a lot of water content there. If you're looking at an analyzer on the wet parts of the stream, a probe like this can be used to condense that water out before you bring the sample over the analyzer. We do a very simple version of a dead man valve where we uh, basically make a swage lock valve, eighth inch, quarter inch, three eighths inch, and add just a small assembly onto it. So the valve, if you want it to be stay in a certain position, the valve naturally, the spring keeps it in one position, let's say normally closed. And if you want to use it, just say, I'm going to run a cal. You have to hold the valve there, but you can't leave it in the wrong position. So we use these as, uh, as dead man or spring return valves. Again, we, this, a lot of this stuff comes up because we, well, this one came up because we had a client who uh, left the valve open after sampling a propane truck and ran the entire contents of the propane truck to flare over a weekend. So we realized, wow, it'd be really nice to make sure that valve closed if I forget it in the wrong position. And so we just designed and built a set of spring return two-way and three-way valves. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about dithiazine testing. It's kind of more of a, a kind of a unique thing we do at TransCanada Pipelines. Um, oh, actually, I got a couple extra slides in here. I'm going to go to here where we're going to sort of finish off. Just to give you an idea of the sort of things we do, I'm just going to run through the sort of sample systems we've done. There's some composite samplers automated grab sampling panels, uh, PLC with automated sampling, solvent flush tanks, just doing sample panels for stream switching, full analyzer installation with grab sampling panels. Again, we kind of focus on those little automated mm -hmm. samplers. Another composite sampler out mounted out in the field, full analyzer building, two composite samplers, solvent flush tank, JP3 infrared analyzer, four automated sampling cylinders, PLC automation taking care of the whole thing. So just wanted to try to give you a little bit of an overview of the kind of projects that we'll work on and do. And certainly if you're looking at doing an integration project, we'd love to talk to you. In addition to the products we manufacture, as we mentioned, we're a manufacturer's rep representative and uh, run a fairly wide range of products from JP3 as near infrared analyzers, Z gas for water and hydrocarbon dew points, UWT for level and solid and liquids, barb and oxygen analyzers and gases and liquids. So we do dissolved oxygen, oxygen and vapor recovery units. COSA Zentar will be index analyzers. Mark metrics for Raman. Extrel process mass spectrometers. We have one in the shop right now for a helium purity application. We're about to do another one for a CO2 pipeline. Uh, Adam for total sulfur and gases and liquids. This is generally as light liquids, things like propane or gasoline. If we get up to doing crude oil, we use Ragaku. Universal analyzers for their distillation probes. Tiger optics, low concentration, parts per million, parts per billion sort of measurements in the gas phase. And LAR for uh, liquid applied research for uh, water purity applications, continuous oxygen demand and the like. So uh, we've got a reasonable range of products. And uh, again, love to talk to you about applications and where they fit. 
Uh, all of this is available on our website. And so if you're uh, looking for any more information, feel free to jump onto our website, insideanalytical.com. We also have a very active page on LinkedIn. So if you look for Inside Analytical on LinkedIn, you'll find us there. And uh, if you're looking to reach out for more information, you can contact myself or Tuan. Um, and you're going to get a copy of all these slides in your email. So you'll have all that contact information there as well. Try my best, I guess, finished at one o'clock and it's 12.59. So probably have time for a question or two, if there are any. And if not, I will uh, let all you guys go. Thanks for showing up today. Um, like I said, just wanted to kind of give you an overview. A lot of us, if you're in Canada and Alberta, a lot of people look at us as, oh, those are the JP3 guys. Those are the guys that sell the JP3 analyzers here. Because that's really where we started and how we started the business and grew. But uh, it's like to give you an idea of we do a lot more than that. And I uh, would be happy to uh, uh, talk to you about any applications you have. Thanks, Evan. Have a great day.